Hey there, I'm Sister Catherine Herms, author of Surviving Depression and Reclaim Regret, How God Heals Life's Disappointments, and the Just a Minute Meditations for Inner Peace and Deeper Trust. It's super to be able to spend these next few moments together with you. I believe that we need more than information to heal our souls, and so as we always do, let us begin. I invite you to realize that you are right now sustained by the unconditional love of God. You are made in the image of this unconditional love. You are a mirror of this unconditional love, a visible manifestation of God's tenderness and merciful love, a love that lasts without end. You are stamped in the deepest part of your existence with the DNA of divine love. And no matter what you do on the surface, nothing can wipe away the divine coating of love that marks your humanity. Let's begin with a deep breath. For a moment, separate yourself from reactive thinking, worry, blame, shame, fear. Sink deep down into the very center of your reality that place within you that knows most deeply that you were made by love and for love. Visualize a favorite image of God or of Jesus. Maybe a story from scripture or a parable that has meant much to you. Settle into a deep stillness and open your heart. If you are overwhelmed and worried, you probably think that you would be most helped by an article on stress or inner peace or hope or perhaps exercise. Instead, I want to share with you a book that I read many years ago now, which which I believe has a message for us in today's world and in today's church. That book is called The Road, and this book won the Pulitzer Prize in 2007, and in 2008 was named by Entertainment Weekly as the most important book in the last 25 years. Cormac McCarthy's novel The Road is set in an indefinite, futuristic, post-apocalyptic world. A father and his young son are making their way through the ruins of a devastated American landscape struggling to survive and preserve the last remnants of their own humanity. They have nothing. They just have a pistol to defend themselves against the lawless bands that stalk the road, and they have the clothes they are wearing. There is a card of scavenged food, and they have each other. As they walk across the wasteland, they pass through a series of horrific encounters in what has become a merciless world, starved of life and of hope. The father, who is trying to protect his son, has grown cynical and practical, willing to even kill others to protect and provide for the son he loves. Pure idealism is represented by the son who trusts his father. Yet, as he witnesses his father's desperate choices to to kill others, the boy begins to beg for the life of those 
who could take the food and clothes that they are trying to preserve for themselves. In one scene, the boy says, He was just hungry, Papa. He's going to die. The man said, He's going to die anyway. The boy responds, He's so scared, Papa. The man squatted and looked at him. He said, I'm scared. Do you understand? I'm scared. The boy didn't answer. He just sat there with his head bowed, sobbing. The man says, you're not the one who has to worry about everything. Jay Armstrong, as he commented on this book, believes that the road forces its characters and its readers to weigh the costs of both compassion and cruelty. That moral divide of, do I dehumanize others for my own survival? Cruelty is the easier of these two instincts. Compassion requires more patience, more commitment. It requires selflessness, a smothering of your own ego to quell the burdens of others so that they may heal and reciprocate such compassion to others. And based on the closing pages of the book, J. Armstrong believes, it's the reciprocation of compassion that in the end will renew the world. The man's death at the end functions as a type of sacrifice. He's pushed himself hard in order to get the boy to a warm climate for winter. Then the boy covers his father who has died with a blanket. In the novel, blankets and food are really valuable items, and so this too has a touch of sacrifice to it. If you read the book, there is a massive darkness and fearful sadness that emerges from the story, and your own heart will be weighed down with this burden until the very last page. Conversations abound on the internet about the ending of the road and what it means. Perhaps I'm a bit naive, but my understanding was very simple. The father had driven off anyone who needed help in order to preserve and protect what his own son needed. In the end, the father dies and entrusts his son to a family they have encountered. Surrounding the image of this family, in my experience of the book, was this gentle simplicity. All they have is love, and they are willing to share any food or goods they have with a stranger. That love, that experience, that glimpse of love that we get on the last page of the book transforms the bleak and hopeless journey through a devastated world. Like the first burst of fireworks in a blank summer sky, humanity once again has a future. The message I got out of the road is that, is that love is our strength to overcome the evils of the world. The road is about love, is about having the courage to be decent in indecent times. That compassion is as primal as cruelty, and that it is compassion and not cruelty that will restore order to a fallen world. Only the courageous can choose compassion. Only the brave can witness within themselves their ego's demands, consistently breaking open the deeper places of love. I believe in the courage that drives one person to stand up for another, even as I see the fear that makes me tremble so small of heart. I touch the anguish of the world, knowing it is no different from the love I insist on holding back from the person nearest me. We can overcome the evils of the world only with the courageous choice by which we as Jesus would give our life for our brother beside us, for our sister beside us, in small decisions that choose compassion over cruelty. 
Being loved, in a Buddhist quote, being deeply loved by someone gives you strength, while loving someone deeply gives you courage. In To Kill a Mockingbird by Harper Lee, the author has Atticus Finch say, I wanted you to see what real courage is, instead of getting the idea that courage is a man with a gun in his hand. It's when you're licked before you begin, but you begin anyway, and see it through no matter what. E.E. E. Cummings said, unless you love someone, nothing else makes any sense. So today I offer you 10 little steps that you can take toward a more compassionate life. Gratitude. Deliver a letter of gratitude in writing or email to a person you are grateful to, but have not thanked appropriately. Counting kindness. Count the acts of kindness you receive every day. Three good things. Write down three things that have gone well for you this week and offer a prayer of thanks to God. Surrender. Release one thing over which you have no control. In your imagination, wrap it in a box and hand it to Jesus. Watch what he does with it. Contentment. Find five things you are already content with about your life, your appearance, your relationships, your work, your family. Now try to find something you are discontent with. How can you become more content with this? Compliments. It's easy to criticize and complain. Rise above criticism and see how many compliments you can offer in a day. Expectations. Write down five positive outcomes that you're expecting throughout today. Making these positive outcomes part of the fabric of your life is a key to combating depression. Count your blessings before you sleep. Keep a gratitude journal by your bed. Each night, write at least three blessings for which you are grateful before you turn out the lights. Let it go. See how many small things during the day you can just let go. And love unconditionally. See others and events through gentle eyes. Focus on the person and their feelings and needs rather than on situations and issues. So let's stop here. Be still. Let the words you have heard take root in your soul like seeds. What do you notice stirring? What emotions or reactions, resistance, calls, thoughts? What do you want to say to Jesus? What do you want him to know, to understand? What do you need him to do something about? Jesus has a word just for you. So for a few seconds, let's listen to his word to each of us. If there is one thing on which we can all agree, it is that the world needs this soul healing. When we're loved, we thrive. It's that simple. The truth is that you can walk free of the wounds that are binding your heart and suffocating your relationships. Healing and holiness is a process, is a journey, and you are already on it. But if you are like me, you might need some simple steps along the way. I hope you join me on my private Facebook group for weekly video conferences. Just look up my name, Sister Catherine Herms. If you become a Patreon member, you will get immediate access to over 60 video and audio programs to help you grow in holiness, as well as exclusive content and monthly journaling pages geared to help you 
on your spiritual journey. So I hope to see you around. Bye now, and may you walk amid the blessings of God this day.